You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have Keith Beverstock. Uh, he's the author of uh, Genes Without Prominence, and a little bit of bio, his uh, primary career interest has been in the effects of ionizing radiation on public health uh, in terms of research and in practice with the World Health Organization. And we're going to talk about uh, that and you know how it's induced uh, genomic instability. So, Keith, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Yes, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about uh, your research. It's, I guess, like any area, there, there usually is like a driving personal interest that pushes people in a certain direction. So what made you uh, look at uh, ionizing radiation and everything? Well, I was uh, working at the uh, Medical Research Council's radiobiology unit. And in fact, actually, I was just on the point of leaving. And um, some of my colleagues got a very strange result. Um, which led to this term genomic instability. Uh, perhaps I'll just tell you briefly what they did. They irradiated, they took some mouse bone marrow cells, they took them freshly from the mouse, and then they irradiated them with alpha particles at a, a relatively low dose. And uh, then they took each uh, irradiated cell, well, not all of them, but they took samples of the irradiated cells and grew them into a clone. So a single cell was put on a medium, and then it was allowed to grow until uh, some 50 or so cells had accumulated. And then they looked at the karyotypes. They looked at the chromosomes. And what they would have expected is if the cell had escaped being irradiated, then all the karyotypes of all the 50-odd cells would be the same. Uh, But if one cell had been irradiated, then there could be damage to that cell, and that damage would be propagated right through the whole uh, offspring line from that cell. So every cell would be the same, would have some maybe some chromosomal anomaly. But what they found was that um, there were many different kinds of chromosomal anomalies in in that uh, so-called non-clonal development of of damage. And that meant that um, <clears throat> after the division, after the irradiation, uh, then cells continued to change. So they may have changed immediately or they may have remained normal for some cell divisions and then started to produce um, abnormalities. And of course, that's well, just well, not uh, a quick, quick question here. Were all the cells changing in the same way? Or with no, the divergence no, no. in how each cell changed? They were producing uh, sometimes very different uh, chromosomal anomalies. It was very complicated because you don't know the, the order in which those cells have divided. But uh, if you don't see any damage at all, then you can assume that um, those are the early cell divisions. And then the later cell divisions are the ones where you see the chromosomal damage. But the, the, the key point here is that the cells were dividing um, and producing new damage, de novo damage, uh, after the irradiation was complete. They only had the one irradiation. Um, so this was, you know, quite uh, unusual. And that set me thinking about, because uh, it, it just, cannot be fitted into the normal Mendelian Darwinian type molecular genetic framework. And so actually I was leaving to go and work with the WHO 
and I wasn't going to be doing any research for what turned out to be 13 years. And I was thinking about that. And then when I resumed my research, I started to really think hard about how that could be happening. But e even before I left WHO, I decided that really, I didn't put it this way, but this is not really genomic instability because we were looking at an aspect of the phenotype. Um, so the cell was doing something um, to the genome. It was changing the chromosomal nature of the genome. And uh, it was not so much that the radiation had changed it, but the radiation had triggered the cell into changing it. So well, that... don't you characterize it as a, you know, the cell's method of adaptation to the stress, to the initial oh, damage? Yeah. 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 Could, couldn't you say that this is the cell's reaction, its adaptation to the, the stress and it's repairing itself or trying to figure out a way to repair itself? Well, uh, you could you could say that it maybe was trying to repair itself, but um, I think we knew quite a lot about uh, the way cells repaired damage to DNA. And um, the but but I, I mean, really, at this stage, it doesn't really matter what what you think that the cell is doing. Uh, but what what you have to recognise is that that those changes that occurred after the irradiation they were not due to uh, the DNA. And there had been another experiment in 1976, which uh, was really the same, illustrating the same effect. Uh, and I'll briefly describe that one as well. Uh, this was uh, K.G. Lunning in uh, Sweden, and he was looking to see whether uh, plutonium, uh, internalized plutonium, would cause any damage among workers in the atomic energy. Uh, establishment. And so he injected mice with some plutonium and he waited until uh, that, that plutonium had got around and irradiated the uh, germ cells. Then he mated those mice with uh, normal females, no, no irradiation of them. And uh, he measured the uh, intrauterine death. So the fetuses died in the uterus to some extent. And then uh, that occurs naturally, and it was increased in those that had an irradiated father. Uh, the, so um, that's what he expected, and intrauterine death is a dominant lethal mutation. So that's why they were dying very early. So he took a survivor, <coughs> a male, or he took male survivors, and without further irradiation, when they were sufficient aids, he mated them. And he got a similarly increased rate of intrauterine death. And so these living males had passed on to their offspring a, um, a dominant lethal mutation. Now, that again means that that cannot have been in the DNA. So what I was um, really uh, wondering is how it is that the cell could be uh, handling this um, this damage uh, when, for example, it wasn't evident in those males. So, what do you think is the uh, the you know what's been going on? What are the cells doing to uh, to preserve these changes and to uh, to come up with all these other changes after the, in the initial uh, the initial harm, the initial radiation? Yeah, well, I think we we have to look at actually some work that was going on uh, in the states at the time that Crick was formulating uh, his, um, you know, uh, sequence hypothesis and the so-called central dogma. So in 1958, in the, in the States, uh, the geneticist David Nanny was thinking about uh, what was happening in cells. Uh, it's only sort of five years after the discovery of the uh, structure of DNA. So he speculated that there were two systems operating in a cell. There was a genetic system, uh, which was the DNA sequence, and there was an epigenetic system, which was kind of based upon that. And the need for that was, for example, that if you take a caterpillar and a butterfly, they have exactly the same DNA sequence, but a very, very different phenotype. So there had to be something beyond just the sequence in the DNA. <clears throat> and that um, was called epigenetics at that time, still called epigenetics, but it 
got a different meaning now because it generally means chromatin marking or chromatin structure. But before, it really just meant over and above genetics. And so there's two systems in the cell. And he pointed out that uh, it's not always easy to tell what you were looking at in a given phenotype. So uh, he gives a number of examples. And so it seemed to me that uh, what we might be looking at, and not just in these experiments, but in every, almost every uh, kind of radiation type experiment we did, um, and the phenotype changed, for example, it became cancerous, we were looking at a epigenetic effect, and in fact, what we would then call, were calling genomic instability. So it's not mutations, that on the DNA that are causing the um, uh, the disease or the phenotype, but the um, epigenetic uh, system responding. And that has to be based around um, the phenotype. And uh, I listened actually to your interview with uh, Jim Shapiro. And Jim oh, is saying, reason. yeah, it was yesterday, I think. <laughs> Um, and uh, what he was saying was that the cell does uh, things, um, exchanging DNA and that sort of thing. But actually, I think it's it's the phenotype that's doing it. And uh, so what what I did was uh, try and reformulate um, the cell, the way we looked at the cell, as an open thermodynamic system, which of course exactly what it is, it's taking right. a neutral, which is free energy, it's processing it, it's producing entropy, and it's growing through metabolism. Um, and uh, it's, it has uh, its phenotype, which I perceive to be the um, output from the reactions one with another of the protein, the gene products, all the gene products, but pro most prominently the proteins. Uh, and um, the first stage was really to say, well, okay, if, if that's how we see the cell, uh, what is the physical nature of the phenotype? And uh, that's what brought me to the, um, the concept of it being an attractor state. And actually that uh, was easier for me to do than for many probably because uh, I had studied earlier energy transfer in DNA and the mechanism that we wanted, uh, which we eventually decided was the mechanism of the energy transfer because DNA is an insulator and that was a thing called a soliton, which is a stable wave which uh, kind of carried the energy along uh, the DNA by compressing the bases together. Uh, and then that traveled as a wave and a soliton is a uh, dynamic steady state, uh, but only, if you like, in, with two components to it. An attractor is a dynamic steady state with many components to it. And so with a... Yeah, I'm, not uh, sure I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. What, what do you think is the mechanism by which, let's say, you know, like in the earlier example you gave, an animal is irradiated, you know, it causes damage, let's say, to the DNA. So well, does that change yeah, the, so, the, the methylation of it? You know, the epi, you know, then we're talking about epigenetics, so it can change the underlying DNA, which is repaired or not repaired. Does it change the methylation, the histone deacetylation of the, uh, of the DNA? I mean, what no, do you no, think the no, mechan no. mechanism is, and what's the result in the change in proteins that are being created? No, no, nothing, nothing to do with that. It, it's, okay. the, DNA is not, the DNA is providing the uh, peptides the precursors of proteins to the cell. And the, the phenotype takes over and uses those peptides. So the DNA is a kind of database, stores the information to make the peptides. That's the genetic system. The peptides come into the cytoplasm. And uh, from then onwards, they are manipulated into producing the, uh, the phenotype. So you, you can compartmentalize it, you can imagine that the, um, the nucleus of the cell is a kind of um, organelle in the, in the cell, and it provides the peptides 
to the demand of the um, of the phenotype in, in much the way, same way as Jim was talking about uh, the cell doing that and I would be more specific and say that it's the phenotype that does that this is phenotype that we well, what, what, is the, what is the phenotype I thought that was the uh the expression of the genes themselves, the, the yeah, characteristics of the creature. Right. Yeah, but, okay. but the phenotype has to be supported by something. And it's supported right. by interacting gene products. And those gene products, uh, they have to be in a rather, I mean, how they, the, the cytoplasm has a lot of gene products in it that it's not using. Um, but it can use, the phenotype can use them to produce what the phenotype wants and needs. Um, it's self-regulating. It, re it regulates itself and produces the properties. I'm, I'll give you an example, a very simple thing, a candle flame. In a candle flame, the heat from the candle flame is melting the wax and the wax is coming up the wick. And this is all uh, a circular causality. The flame causes itself once the candle has been lit. And... Um, this is the same sort of thing, and it's the same sort of thing I'm talking to you now because we had an agreement that I would call you at uh, 10 o'clock my time. Yeah. And so I am being self-regulated in that. Um, so all I'm saying is that the phenotype is an object like this. I know it's very different from the genetically regulated um, conventional model, uh yes it is different but the are you saying that the the phenotype has a consciousness itself i mean where you know i guess people would ask where is this phenotype what is it made no, of where does the the consciousness the of it reside you know how does it have a, an intent it resides in the cytoplasm it's it's the okay. it's actually a very specific reacting oh. mixture of gene products okay so the aggregate cytoplasm of all the cells in the body is the phenotype? We're or... looking at one cell, and we're, produ we're talking about the cellular phenotype. We're not talking about the phenotype of the whole organ, of a multicellular organism. That, that's a, some kind of sum of the cellular phenotypes. We're talking about the cellular phenotype of an individual cell. Mm, okay. So the DNA is, is there. I, what I think causes the cell to to do this um, switching, if you like, uh, of its phenotype, because that's what's going on. What is causing that is the stress that the radiation has caused to the cell by making the cell repair that DNA. Now, if it uh, gets all the gene products that it needs to repair the DNA successfully before cell division, then everything is okay. But if some gene products are missing, they're exhausted. They've, they've been completely used up, for example. Um, then the, this very specific mix of proteins collapses. The attractor, which is a quasi-stable state, that collapses. And in fact, in a system as complex as a cell, it goes to a variant phenotype or a variant attractor. So, mm. So you get a change in phenotype of the cell, and that may be a change towards cancer, for example. There's the damage to the DNA, the specific damage to the DNA, is not relevant here. There may have been damage. Why wouldn't it be relevant? You, oh, so you don't think that it informs how to fix it and what other changes may cascade from that? No. I, the, the DNA, uh, if, if you make mutations in the DNA, for the most part, it doesn't matter. There are some circumstances in which it does matter. And if those are the, um, if you affect the amino acids that are the binding site of a DNA, so of, of, a, of a protein, for example, so it cannot bind. Uh, so a, trans, a, a transcription product, if you if you damage its um, binding site with a mutation, that's let's say four or five out of 200 or 400 amino acids then you might uh, see some effect. But for the rest of the amino acids, mostly they can change quite a lot and there's, there's no damage. So it's not the damage to the DNA which is giving rise to the phenotype abnormalities, 
It's to do with what the phenotype is doing with the products, that the gene products that come from that DNA. So there's no connection. There's, it's not genetically regulated. So there's no connection. There's no point in looking with GWAS, these genome-wide association techniques, for information about the, um, uh, the cellular phenotype. And we know. I mean, since that's, that's uh, kind of odd was, because uh, that's kind of odd because certain damage would kill a cell, certain damage wouldn't kill it, and I would certainly think that depending on what parts of the you know of the base pair sequence are affected, you know if it includes introns and other features, or if it's a huge C part of the sequence, or a small yeah, part or multiple yeah. parts, that would definitely change how how or if the cell is able to fix it and move on. Well, if you Excuse me, if you're talking about killing a cell, we're not talking about the same subject. We're talking about what happens to a cell uh, in its normal lifetime. And I mean, radiation, uh, these, these doses of radiation are not lethal to the cell. Or if they are lethal to the cell, the cell drops out of the whole equation. So we're not talking about cell death. We're talking about uh, whether whether cells get a, uh, a malignant phenotype, that sort of thing, or a disease, any disease phenotype. So we're not we're not talking well, about. Well, I mean, that. there's 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 many. Uh, so no no death, but there's many different diseases. So that would mean that the cell had been affected uh, differently by each yeah. disease and tried to correct itself and you know wasn't able to, and so it was affected differently well, by it, each disease. It it tried it. The way I look at it, it tried to correct itself. In trying to do that, it became, it was stressed and it underwent a phenotypic change, mm. which was independent of what the damage was on the DNA. Well, if it was independent of what the damage was in the DNA, why would uh, we have different manifestations of disease? Why would we have different symptoms and effects? Well, because you've got a lot of phenotypes. <laughs> Uh, you've got malignant disease phenotypes. You've got phenotypes for uh, schizophrenia, for diabetes, for all kinds of diseases. Um, and that's what people are looking for those with uh, uh, with uh, GWAS. And what I'm saying is that that's not, that's not going to work. And the evidence is showing that it doesn't work. I mean, there was a paper only a few weeks ago by uh, Nigel Panna from, I think, Michigan University saying that uh, since uh, 1988, there had been no measurable advance in public health as a result of molecular genetic research, and 10 billion US dollars spent in one institute, the National uh, Human Genome Research Institute. 10 billion dollars spent between 1988 and more or less now. And no measurable uh, advantage for human health. So, wow. I mean, it's not working. This technique is not working. It's a failure. So, what uh, I mean, what does this tell you that would work, or what's the consequence of this then? Well, the consequence is that uh, diseases are occurring in our cells, if you like. Uh, but it's by a different mechanism than damage, mutational damage to the DNA. It's by this process, which is we have called genomic instability, but which in reality is, in fact, phenotypic instability. And, and you can see the basis of the physics is a um, quasi-stable state, which means that it's stable most of the time under perturbation, under pressure, but you can put enough pressure on it to cause it to switch to another uh, or variant attractor or variant phenotype. And you can imagine that there's a, um, a state space, if you like, of different phenotypes, and you've set in motion a, a kind of migration through these different phenotypes when you induce this, what, as I say, genomic instability. So when that occurs, from any form of stress, not just radiation, because air pollution and uh, bacterial infections and all sorts of things are causing, are capable of causing genomic instability. And uh, this is the basis, I think, for disease. 
No mutation. Okay. Um, what would you do then to address disease, or is it not really at that point in your mind? You know, you're well, just trying to find the, the the real basis instead of mutation basis. Yeah. Well, I think uh, a lot of disease, and I mean, I, my main interest has been in cancer of one kind or another, and uh, it's uh, it, it's environmental factors, diet and lifestyle, and factors like that that are mainly causing cancers, not not mutation. Now, I'm not, I don't know about other diseases like schizophrenia or diabetes, only that looking at the results, we're seeing the same thing across the board of different diseases when you study, say, 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 patients, you sequence their DNA, you look for these SMPs, these anomalies, uh, and you can maybe find 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 or even 1,000. And each one is so minuscule in its um, effects that the sum of all those uh, so-called genetic anomalies, uh, it comes to just 2 or 3% of the total risk. So that's leading to this term missing heritability. Most of the heritability is missing because we're talking about diseases which are inherited from your parents. And uh, most of that is missing in these in these uh, GWAS kind of studies, these DNA sequence studies. And this is a major problem. And uh, I mean, huge sums of money being spent and they're virtually, as Paneth says, no progress being made. So um, we have to look for another solution, even if we didn't know about genomic instability and well, I wasn't trying to uh, resolve a problem that came up in 1991. Uh, we, we still, I would say, we should look at the cell on the basis of physics. I mean, chemistry is based in physics. We have the atomic theory. We have, if you like, the phenotypes of all the uh, elements. They fit onto the Mendeleev classification. This is, a, this is the real science subject. Biology is different. Um, back in 1935, uh, Max Delbruck, famous physicist, he said that uh, genetics was a closed but logically consistent uh, science without uh, a measurement system. Now, what he really meant was it didn't have a basis in physics. So it's just based on statistics. And so why not look at the cell? What is it in terms of a physical entity and how is it working? And that's what actually uh, Arthur Anala and several other colleagues, um, Mauna Ronco, that's what we have tried to do. And the view that we get is that the DNA is not as important as most people think it is. Hmm. So I guess a lot of the, uh, the research to sequence hundreds of thousands and millions of people looking for magical cure-alls is, is probably going to come to naught would have come up pretty far short. Well, so far it hasn't achieved anything, is, is what Panas and his colleagues are saying. So, um, okay, I could be proved wrong, of course. I mean, look, I'm not a biologist. I'm a physical chemist by training. Um, I'm just looking at this from a, a physics point of view. What is the basis of this thing we call the cell? Um, why don't geneticists want to know what is the physical nature of the cellular phenotype. You know, I mean, we've proposed it's an attractor state of a complex system. Uh, it's all defined in, in our publications. So if you want to criticize it, please do come up with some other uh, reason why we're wrong. But um, uh, this is, this is we, we're really just providing another view from outside of biology, because actually none of us are biologists. Um, but we're just saying, well, look, this is the way we think the system works, and it's not the way you think it works. Mm, okay. So what would be, uh, you know, if you were able to tell the powers that be, don't just sequence the DNA, that's not really going to get you any results. What, what should they do? What should well, they look I at to see, you know, to help combat disease, for instance? 
Well, I, I think we should know a lot more. I mean, we do know some things which, I mean, smoking causes lung cancer and several other cancers. Um, we, we should be looking at um, what are those environmental causes and um, <clears throat> other diseases. Uh, I mean, we know the very strong connection between diabetes and uh, uh, overweight. Um, and well, many diseases in overweight. So, I mean, these are I think, the areas we, we shouldn't think that we can get a quick fix from knowing what the gene is that's mm. supposed to be doing this. We have to do the hard work of finding out what are the, um, the, the causes where there is stress. And it can be stress in, in many kinds of ways. Uh, I think we, we need to explore that just to how can you stress the system uh, or what does stress the system um, and where do these diseases arise? Because I don't think we have any reason to think that they're coming from the gene. So where do you think the uh, the sentience and the direction and the purposiveness you know, of any organism, including us, comes from? Is it in the, the aggregate cytoplasm of all our cells or you know, where do you think no. it is? No, because what we know, uh, and as uh, Jim said, even bacteria have uh, are doing kind of purposeful things. And but uh, I took quite a lot of interest in experiments with slime molds. I didn't do the experiments, but I just looked in the literature. That's a very primitive organism, but um, it does appear to be able to uh, take evasive action against. Uh, something which is toxic, which is light. So actually some experiments done in Japan show that uh, the, um, th these organisms will, you know, they have to get food, so you can challenge them to get their food in darkness or in light. And you see that they much prefer to choose the darkness and not the light. So that that kind of experiment shows that even the most primitive organisms uh, have this, we might call it consciousness or purposefulness. Um, we're exploring this, and actually that's one of the things uh, that I'm working with uh, a couple of uh, botanists um, here in Bonn, and they're talking about plant intelligence and root intelligence. So, you know, roots will do kind of amazing things. <laughs> To, to get themselves out of uh, difficult situations where their growth downwards is blocked. So, um, and actually, uh, Darwin said that uh, there was something in the tip of the root which was rather like a brain. So we do have that, and I, I think that that is a product of protein chemistry. But the problem, if I may say, about <coughs> chemists is that they prefer to do their experiments with dilute aqueous solutions. And the proteins may behave very differently in the cytoplasm, which has up to 30% of solute in it. So it's a very concentrated solution, if it is indeed a solution. Um, and uh, it's a totally different environment than a very dilute tris buffer in the test tube. So I don't think you can expect to see the kind of chemistry um, might be occurring. I mean, we can take. The, I think what the solution lies in in the way proteins can work, and uh, you can extract three proteins from um, very uh, primitive organism and put some ATP to give some energy, and those three proteins will cycle in a way that they go through a cycle which lasts for 24 hours, which is exactly the circadian rhythm, and you can do that in a test tube. Uh, that's an exception, uh, but it's very puzzling how that very simple system works. So I think that there is a um, potential for finding out. This. I mean, consciousness, it, it, it has to be there because, I mean, if you're unconscious, you're just waiting to be, if you're, I mean, an organism. Yeah, you're <laughs> conscious, you're conscious, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so... So organisms, even the most primitive, if they were to to have evolved into higher organisms, they must have had some form of consciousness, awareness of their surroundings, 
and the ability to make decisions in order to avoid uh, being eaten, shall we say. And in fact, it's, uh, it's all spelled out in a book by um, uh, Dennis, I can't think of his name now, but it's called um, uh, A Computer in Every Cell. And uh, he goes through the whole history of um, biologists once they got a microscope looking at very small organisms, uh, very primitive organisms, and seeing some kind of purposeful behavior. Um, sorry, I can't remember his name. So, so yeah, no I worries, think uh, that that you know, looking at the cell as we do, I would say that the phenotype was, if you like, the closest thing to the brain in the cell. Mm, okay. Well, very good. Well, we're uh, we're you know, it seems to have gone extremely fast. But we're we're kind of at the end of our time. What, what's the best uh, way to get more resources for listeners so they can uh, understand more of what the, you know, your theories are and what your work involves? Yeah, um, I w- I will, I've got a website. Uh, I can send you that. Um, I'm okay. trying to... Oh, go ahead. The website, you'll send it, yes. Uh, well, I'm trying to collect all the uh, relevant publications onto one page. Um, the Today I was having difficulty in uploading that onto the uh, internet, but as soon as I achieve that, which probably will be tomorrow, um, there will be a specific page on the website to to look at those publications, and I put them in the order in which they were written. So you can follow through if you're interested in the uh, the kind of unfolding of these how these ideas unfolded with time. Okay. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and thank you for your time. Okay. You're welcome. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.